weaknesses for the Tennessee football team entering the 2023 season. Which of those weaknesses could be a strength when it's all said and done? That's our topic of conversation on a football topic. Fridays, Locked on Balls. You are Locked on Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into it. Happy Friday. And hey, the weekend is just around the corner and no better place to get started. Your tailgate started for the weekend than right here on Locked On Vols. Appreciate you guys. I'm your host, Eric Kane, and you can always find Locked On Vols Weekday mornings for your morning commute. Shout out every dayers. Appreciate you guys. Uh, let me know where and how you guys consume Locked On Balls. Y'all are the best. And uh, if you're new to the show, hey, become an everydayer. Subscribe to Locked On Balls on the YouTube channel. Subscribe everywhere you get your podcasts Apple Podcasts, Odyssey app, Spotify, wherever that is. Really, really do appreciate you guys in that regard. Hey, today we're going to discuss some weaknesses for Tennessee football, but how some of those weaknesses can become a strength by the end of the season. An interesting topic we'll get into here in just a couple of minutes. Tennessee added another uh, transfer portal edition after I had already concluded recording and producing yesterday's show. So uh, we're going to recap Chris Ledlam and tell you what he brings uh, to the big orange basketball courts in segment number two. And then, hey, I know a lot of you guys are not baseball fans or maybe checked out on Tennessee baseball this year, but um, where does the Tennessee baseball team stand right now? What needs to happen for them to reach a regional? And what's to come with number four Vanderbilt coming to Lindsey Nelson Stadium this weekend? A big rivalry series upcoming. All that and more here on your Friday Locked on Vols. All right, if I'm going to paint a picture for you and say weaknesses for the University of Tennessee, which position groups would you guys give me uh, the paint for, right? Is it going to be obviously the secondary? Okay, that would be a weakness. That would likely be my number one weakness. Number two right now might be the offensive line. All right, so offensive line would be number two. Number three, I guess, would be probably tight end. And a lot of you guys are not maybe not thinking about that as much as I am, but I'm just obsessed with the tight end position uh, for Tennessee, and it, it's still a big question mark. And and I do think Ethan Davis provided a little bit of clarity for that. But again, he's he he got injured in the Orange and White game. Um, how much is he a full go when fall camp happens? You know, all that's to be determined. He'll be back. He'll be suited up this fall. But he's going to lose a lot of development time. We'll get into that here in just a second. But uh, nonetheless, those are probably the biggest weaknesses I can think of for Tennessee football team right now. Quickly, I'll go over the other positions and tell you why I don't think they're the weaknesses. Um, we'll work our way down, start on defense. If secondary is a weakness, what about the middle layer, the linebackers? Sure, you lose Jeremy Banks, a very productive player for you. Sure, you lose Juwan Mitchell, who played some football for you the last two years. You lose Solon Page, who gave you about 15 to 20 snaps a game and in his role and played a lot more the past uh, 2021 season. But I think that group right now is the as best as it's going to be in terms of, or the, the best it's been in terms of quality bodies in the room. Um, you, you bring back Aaron Beasley, who has really come into his own, kind of broke out a little bit last year, uh, being a really, really good player. You add experience with Keenan Peely, uh, who has been there, done that, and he's going to be a starter for you. Elijah Herring, you're expecting to take a step up. And then that influx of, of young guys, along with Caleb Perry, who's a sophomore, and Aaron Carter, Jeremiah T. Lander, and Jalen Smith. That is why, because you have more bodies, quality bodies, I, I don't deem linebackers a weakness. Defensive line, sure, you lose Byron Young at the Leo position. You lose... Uh, Latrell Bumpus at the rush in position. Um, you lose a couple of guys off that front, but it's such a rotational spot that you bring back so much. Leo might come into that conversation in terms of being a, a weakness, but I just think the sky's the limit for that group because you have James Pierce and Joshua Josephs and Caleb Herring, who's going to play some this year. And I think if those guys can just take a little bit of a step, that Leo position is going to be in decent shape this year. Um, quarterback's not a weakness because I understand Joe Milton's got to prove it, but um, he's six-year quarterback player, third year in the system. Um, I'll, I'll take my chances with Joe in this offense right now more than you know anybody else. Running backs, it's it's you know you've got so, so many different guys in that room. Plus, you bring back so much in in terms of returning production. Wide receiver, you get your top four guys out there. You feel really good about it. So, um, those are why I don't think those position groups are weaknesses. Secondary, of course, why it can be a positive by the end of the season. It's because of that influx of youth in that group 
that I think is going to push those upperclassmen into playing better and or if they're not playing better, they'll be replaced. Um, and maybe not like replaced as a starter, quote unquote, but if you're continuing to get beat over the middle or you can't cover your third of the field or you're missing tackles in the open field, they've been reluctant, the coaching staff, to take that guy off the field and put somebody else in there for two, for two years because they didn't have faith in the quality of depth. I think that's changed this year. I think that influx of youth talent and Ricky Gibson, Jordan Matthews, of course, the transfer gave Judy Lawley a cornerback allows them to make some more moves at corner. I think Jordan Thomas, his progression is continuing to, to to get better at the safety position. I think John Slaughter coming in, and he had a quiet spring, but again, that's another guy that can push for uh, you know push those upperclassmen at the safety position as well. I just think that there's more options there. So I think the ability to where you might still see Jalen McCullough out there playing a lot, right? You might still see Warren Burrell out there playing a lot. But if those guys make mistakes, I think you'll be quick to, to put somebody else in there and, and try to make things better. And so for that reason alone, just, again, the quality of depth, I think is why the defense, the secondary, could turn into more of a strength by the end of the season. Now, they got to go out and do it uh, than, than what we've seen so far in the first two years for Josh Heupel and Tim Banks in that defense. So uh, we will see. Uh, Tennessee's pass defense was second worst in the SEC last year, only to Vanderbilt. <clears throat> excuse me, and um, there's only one way to go up, in my opinion, And uh, you know, when I look at it in that regards. What about the offensive line? Now, we were in a similar predicament heading into the 2022 season, trying to find a tackle, okay? Now, you're trying to find another position as well this year. You're trying to find a tackle. You're trying to find a guard. I think you are in the exact same position, not the exact same position, but I think you're in a very similar position as you were last year because, sure, you're trying to replace a tackle, but the other position you're trying to replace, at least they're guys that you already know who can play in the system and who have done it. That does not mean that they will flourish. That does not mean that it's all said and done and Tennessee is going to be top 10 offense. It just means John Campbell is going to be one of your starting tackles, going to be on the left side most likely, right? We're operating under that assumption. The right tackle, you've got Gerald Mincy, J.J. Crawford, and Dane Davis. Dane Davis has played a lot of football for you the last couple of years. J.J. Crawford and Jeremiah, uh, J.J. Crawford and, and Gerald Mincy split the left tackle job last year almost 50-50. So they both played and both contributed and both did things well for the number one offense in the country. Sure, they are flipping sides, and that's a big question mark. You know, how do you adapt to the right side? But they've done it before in this system. So, for, at least for me, that gives me faith that they're going to do it again. Now, finding a left guard, and, and again, this is under the assumption that John Campbell's coming and won a job at left tackle, and again, he's new to the system and everything, but right now and everything we hear and the vibe and everything is, you know, John Campbell's going to be left tackle. They just got to find the other one. And, and so, you know, that's kind of what we're operating with. Now, trying to find a guard is a little bit more head-scratching, I guess. Andre Carrick did not come in and run away with that job. He's new to the system, and, you know, he might in fall camp, but he hasn't done it yet. Um, you know, lack of physicality and, and, and stuff in, in terms of the trench play uh, has been a worry in spring practice. Again, don't write him off. I'm just saying right now he's not won that job. Ollie Lane's a guy that's played an awful lot. Uh, he was sidelined the last two weeks of spring practice, okay? Um, you got Jackson Lampley, who's a guy that's been in the system but never really been a, a keynote starter for you. And then you have Addison Nichols, who I think is probably the – you know, if I'm if I'm FanDuel over now and I'm 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 putting like betting favorites to win that left tackle left guard job, I'll say it right now. Addison Nichols, boring bringing in somebody else, might be my odds on favorite to win that job right now. And that's a guy that split time between guard and center during spring practice, so it's very much more up in the air. However, that offense is going to go. That offense is going to scheme up mismatches. That offense, if you got a quarterback that can make throws, you're going to get your yards. You're going to get your touchdowns. And again, you have, you have to have those hog mollies up front to block for you. But I just think that, you know, this offense is going to mask a lot of that, truly. And, and I don't I don't mean to take anything away from the offensive line because literally you can't do anything without the offensive line play. But this offense does mask a little bit. Not a lot, a little bit of that, okay? And so I just, I have faith in Josh Heupel and this offensive system that they're going to figure it out. Now, the other one real quickly is tied in. You lose Princeton fans. You bring back Jacob Warren, which is huge. But you have to, no matter what, have two tight ends that can roll in this offense. And you got McCallan Castles that came in from UC Davis, and he is going to play no matter what, you know, as long as he's healthy. How productive can he be? How comfortable is he playing the H-back role, the inline role, the tight end with a hand in the dirt? 
How much can Ethan Davis push him? Of course, Ethan Davis had a really good spring, and he was tasked with answering those questions as well. Um, but in terms of the blocking stuff, and of course, he had the collarbone issue there towards the end of the orange and white game. That's going to set him back a few weeks, and we'll see exactly what he looks like in fall camp. He'll play this year, but how, how much time is he going to miss maybe at the beginning? We'll, we'll see. Um, but I do think you got more athletic at tight end this year, for sure. Um, but can those guys handle the physicality? Again, I have faith in this offensive system. I have faith in Joey Halsley and Josh Heupel. I think this offense will it lead the nation in points and yards per game. I don't know, but I have faith in this offense that they're going to figure it out. So those would be my biggest three question marks. The secondary, the offensive line, and the tight end position. I gave my arguments for why I think that they could be strengths by the end of the season. I mean, if Tennessee's a top 10 offense in the country, those, those position groups are going to be strengths no matter what, right? Um, that's just kind of how it is. And so far in two years, Tennessee has been a top 10 offense. And last year, of course, they you know led the nation in offense. So uh, we will see. But those are some of the biggest weaknesses for Tennessee's team right now. What say you? Am I missing anybody? Am I missing a position group? Am I missing uh, a special teams unit? You tell me. What weaknesses are out there that are worrying you the most right now? Let's talk about it right here at Locked On Vols. Guys, I appreciate it. We'll come back. We'll talk a little Tennessee hoops and do Transfer Portal Edition, the second Transfer Portal Edition of the week, and the third big news item. Of course, you lump that in with Santiago Vescovi. We'll talk Tennessee hoops on the other side. But, hey, something exciting is coming to Built.com on April 22nd. I don't have all the details just yet, but the excitement is real, and it's something that you don't want to miss. If you know how Built works, well, they have the most incredible protein bars in the world. They do these amazing flavor jumps with unreal flavors in limited quantity. So mark your calendars and head to Built.com on Saturday, April 22nd to be one of the first to discover what all the hype is about. I can't wait to see what this new flavor is. Make sure to use promo code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your order. That is at Built.com, Saturday, April 22nd. All right, guys, segment number two of a Friday show. Appreciate you guys for hanging out with me here on Locked on Vols. And um, I want to make it your first listen, of course, but I want to remind you guys, Locked on NFL Mock Draft Special is here, and it's bigger than ever. Follow along with all 32 teams' first pick in a six-episode Ultimate Mock Draft experience only Locked On can deliver. All episodes are available now on Locked On NFL Draft and on the YouTube channel or wherever you listen to your podcast. So, hey, it's a six-episode premiere top situation. All those episodes are up right now, to my understanding. Your boy chimes in on a bunch of Tennessee targets, a bunch of uh, Tennessee guys, and you'll get to see my face on that as well. So uh, we're going to, next week, leading up to the draft, we're going to nitpick a little bit of Locked On uh, NFL drafts, mock drafts, all 32 picks, and see kind of where they have those Tennessee Vols and maybe who they left out. That's coming up next week right here on the show. Okay, so Tennessee, another big addition. This one literally is figuratively, uh, or no, excuse me, literally <laughs> a big addition to the Tennessee basketball team. Uh, Tennessee announced the commitment of Harvard forward Chris Ledlam uh, to the team yesterday. Actually, he announced it. Tennessee is yet Tennessee will sign him, but Tennessee can't say anything until he's officially signed. Six foot six, two hundred and twenty-five pound junior from Staten Island, New York. He announced that decision on Instagram on Wednesday. He averaged thirteen point six points per game, six point seven rebounds per game over the last three seasons at Harvard. Uh, he's the second commit in its many days from the transfer portal. If you remember following USC upstate guard Jordan Ganey, who committed to Tennessee on Tuesday, Santiago Vescovi announced also on Tuesday night that he is going to return, take advantage of that COVID year, and uh, play a fifth season for the University of uh, Tennessee. So, you know, Chris Levelin was a guy that Tennessee targeted early on in the process when the transfer portal opened up. Rod Clark, assistant basketball coach, made a trip up to Boston on March 24th to see Ledlam. They hosted him for an official visit uh, I want to this past weekend, yeah. And then Tennessee staff went back up to Boston to see him earlier this week prior to committing to the Volunteers over St. John's and Indiana. Uh, this last year as a junior, he was really, really good. 18.8 points per game. 8.5 rebounds per game in 28 games at Harvard. He averaged 16.7 points per game, 9.3 rebounds per game as a sophomore in 2021-2022. That's kind of when he jumped out 
and, and you know, kind of made a name for himself. Started 27 times in 28 games as a junior, averaged over 30 minutes per game, which is huge because typically, unless you're Santiago Vescovi or you know a backcourt player, you don't average over 30 minutes a game in this this Tennessee system. But this big man averaged playing over 31 minutes a game. Uh, for Harvard, scored in double figures 26 times this past season, tallied nine double doubles, had a season high 35 points and 12 rebounds against Cornell. That was back in February. And if you look at it all together in 70 games, uh, Ledlam over the past three seasons, he's averaged 13.6 points per game, 4.6 rebounds per game, 1.8 steals per game, 1.5 assists per game, and 24 minutes. And making 41 starts. So a guy that can do just a little bit of everything. And now, you know, the, I'm, I'm no basketball X's and O's guy. I don't, I don't try to be, right? But for me, this means that, like, hey, Tennessee can play that small ball that they love at six foot six, 200, and how, how big is he? Six foot 225 pounds. This can be your, you know, your big four, right? In, in a small lineup. This can be your four in a small lineup. And sometimes maybe even a five if you go really, uh, really small. So, um, I, I really like this this commit. This is a guy that Tennessee wanted for sure. Does he have the athletic ability and the and the upside of a Julian Phillips? Absolutely not. But the difference between Julian Phillips and Chris Ledlam is, well, Chris Ledlam's an experienced guy. He's played the college game for a long time. He's been there, done that, and he's a more proven, productive scorer at this point in his career. So we will still see what Julian Phillips is going to decide to do. Phillips and, and Josiah Jordan James, uh, they are going to go through the NBA draft process, get feedback, all that type of stuff. Um, it's still with me. This is just me. Things can always change. I don't expect Triple J to be on the roster next year at all. Obviously, I don't expect Uros Plofs just to be on the roster at all. Of course, they technically have a year. Um, I expected the last week or two that Santiago Vescovi was coming back because the longer this thing dragged on, um, the, the, the more he was going to come back. And, you know, I heard things, you know, as, as early as, you know, even in basketball season that he was, you know, planning on coming back. So I don't expect Uros, don't expect Josiah Jordan James, don't expect Olivier Cumwell back whatsoever. Um, Santi is back. Julian Phillips, we will see. Now, to my understanding too, though, here's the thing. If Julian Phillips says he wants to come back, Tennessee will have to make room for him somewhere. Um, because I believe you have 13 guys on scholarship right now. Of course, you got the addition of USC Upstate transfer Jordan Ganey as well. So uh, we'll have to see how that might work. I'm not going to theorize on the show right now because I just think that's um, I just don't think that's very professional. Um, but uh, to be completely honest with you, um, but if if Julian Phillips wants to come back at the end of this process. I would assume that Rick Barnes would welcome him back with open arms, and that would be a huge addition. But again, we will see. We will see. Um, but uh, not hearing an awful lot right now. I wouldn't assume that that's going to happen at this point in time. But uh, still, it is it is a possibility. Uh, quickly on Jordan Ganey, we we talked on him a little bit on yesterday's show for you every for you everydayers. Um, Ganey coming from USC Upstate. He is the Jordan Ganey is the son of. Uh, Justin Ganey, Tennessee's associate head coach, six foot four, 175 pounds from USC Upstate. Um, he is a guy that averaged 15.2 points per game, 2.3 assists, and 31.7 minutes per game, shooting 39.3% from the field, 34.5% from three point line in 32 games as a sophomore or uh, as a, uh, this past year. Uh, two years ago, he shot over 40% from uh, the three. Actually, Let's see, as a freshman, yeah, as a freshman in 2021-2022, Ganey shot 47.1% from the field, and wait for it, 49.3% from three-point range. He made 74 of 150 three-point shot attempts as a freshman. He was 70 of 203 as a sophomore. Um, he is a two-time All-Big South pick at USC Upstate, a really, really nice guy that I think can grow grow into a, a roll-top player for Tennessee, so... We'll have to see. But it was a bit of a big week for Tennessee in terms of uh, basketball roster management. This is your team right now. Um, we'll see exactly what Julian Phillips does at the end of his NBA draft process. Uh, but getting a big get. Getting a big get. How about that? Chris Ledlam, 6'6", 225 pounds from Harvard. And I think he's going to be a good one for the University of Tennessee. Hey, when we come back, we will conclude a Friday edition of Locked On Vols. And we'll tell you about this baseball team. What needs to happen for this baseball team to make it to, to a regional play. And obviously the Vanderbilt Commodores coming up this weekend. That and more coming up next as we conclude this week's worth of Locked On Balls. 
All right, guys, we got a final segment left here of this edition of Locked On Vols. I'm your host, Eric Kane. And uh, let's talk a little baseball, shall we? A little Tennessee baseball. What is going on with the Tennessee baseball team? Um, they are 23 and 14 right now, 5 and 10 at the midway point of Southeastern Conference play. 15 more conference games to go, and they're going to be a big one. Simply put, if you um, haven't been keeping up with the Tennessee baseball team, it lost every position player that was a starter last year. It brought back a lot of key role players like Christian Moore and Jared Dickey and, and a lot of these guys. But in terms of position players, lost all eight starters. Okay, so that was already going to be a big undertaking in trying to replace those guys. You brought back your starting rotation. They got All-American this, All-American that, all that type of stuff. They have taken a step back this year. Overall, they have not been nearly as dominant as they were this past season. Um some of that because of their own doing, some of that's uh, a lot of that's, and, and this has been the biggest issue for Tennessee, poor defense this year in the field. It's been really, really bad defensively. Um, Tennessee is a really, really interesting stat, and I'm going to pull it up here on the fly. Uh, Tennessee ranks worst in the conference this year uh, in terms of, let me find this here. All right. SEC teams by percentage of runs that are unearned conference games only. Okay. So the percentage of runs that are unearned in 15 conference games, Tennessee has the highest percentage in the conference at 24.7. 24.7. That means a fourth of the runs that have been allowed in 15 conference games this year have been unearned. J just insane. Absolutely insane. That just goes to show you how poorly the defense has played this year. And that's a shame because if Tennessee could just play some defense, I really do believe they would be, you know, right in the regional conversation right now. They would really be, or they are in the regional conversation, but they'd be okay. You know, would they be dominant? No, there's still some other flaws here, but uh, defense has really been a major hiccup for this Tennessee baseball team, you know, to date. Right now with Tennessee, you have a fit, you have a um, a five and ten record in Southeastern Conference play. Uh, if you're new to following along college baseball and SEC baseball and SEC play, if you have a fifteen, you play thirty SEC games. If you have a fifteen and fifteen record in conference, okay, you're considered a lock for the postseason. A fourteen and sixteen record in conference, and you're in a really good spot to make it, considering this league it will produce a top 40 RPI from teams who have a 14 and 16 record. I'll get to more of that RPI here in a moment. The 2019 Volunteers team got in at 14 and 16. That was the year that they went to Chapel Hill and lost in that regional. Ole Miss, who won the national championship last year, got in with a 14 and 16 record in Southeastern Conference play. All right. If you have anything less than 14 in conference play, then you need to make a long run in Hoover in your conference tournament, in my opinion. Um, so you really want to help your, your yourself out. Remember, only the top 12 teams, 12 of the 14 teams in conference play, make it to the conference tournament in Hoover each and every year. Now, uh, back to that RPI, okay? Tennessee lost. Tennessee's been losing a lot lately. In fact, first time since 2016, Tennessee's dropped four games in a row. First time Tennessee's dropped four games in a row under Tony Votello. Tennessee was swept at Arkansas and then lost to Tennessee Tech in the midweek this earlier this week. Um, try to make this as, as concise as possible. Uh, midweek is not real baseball, okay? That is how I view it. Midweek is not real baseball. So <laughs> um, what I mean by that is it, it serves a purpose. You need to get your guys work, your arms work, all right? So typically the way Tennessee treats a midweek is you pitch – you know, maybe a starter for two innings, maybe the first guy of the bullpen for two innings, and then it's a new guy every, you know, every every single inning, and sometimes a couple guys per inning just to get work in. All right, and so if Tennessee were to go out there and throw Andrew Lindsay or, or Chase Dolander or or Drew Beam or whatever for six seven innings, you know, Tennessee would have probably beaten Tennessee Tech. Maybe not the way that they're pitching now, at least some of them, but. uh uh, anyway, I mean, that that's that's kind of how these midweeks work, right? Tennessee dropped a, a Boston College self-imploding game earlier this year in the midweek. Also, first time in, in under Vitello, I believe. Uh, maybe that's wrong. Tennessee is 69-10 and 10 in midweek games under Tony Vitello, but they've dropped two midweek games so far this year. Anyway, the Boston College midweek loss earlier in the season was self-imploding, errors, base running mistakes, all that type of stuff. Easily, if you didn't just throw, you know, seven guys out of the pen, you, you probably could have won that one. But anyway... Because you lost to Tennessee Tech 
on Tuesday, you dropped 18 spots in the RPI, which is unfortunate. But if you do what you need to do in winning these series to, to get to that 14 and 16 record in conference play, that RPI will take care of itself. Now, what do you need to do? All right, you are five and 10 in conference play right now with 15 more games to go against Vanderbilt, Mississippi State, at Georgia, Kentucky, at South Carolina. The Vols need to win every, this is my quickest, easiest path to the postseason, okay? Tennessee needs to win every remaining home series, meaning taking two or three games, all right? And would would love to win on the road at Georgia as well, winning that series two games to three. If you do that, that would put you at 14 and 16 entering Hoover. Mississippi State is very much down this year. If you swept Mississippi State, and I feel like Georgia could be a a contestant to be swept on the road as well, that would very much help you in this case, and also kind of buy you some breathing room as well. Maybe if you drop, say, the Vanderbilt series, which is very, very plausible. Vanderbilt's number four in the country. Um, So you made your bed. You got to lie in it, right? It's tough sledding for Tennessee, and your back's against the wall, but that's kind of what you're looking at right there. Tennessee has been on on a tremendous, challenging slate here lately. The last four SEC or the last three SEC series has been at number one LSU, back home against number three Florida, at number five Arkansas, and now hosting number four Vanderbilt. I mean, that's that's four straight series against a top four opponent. And Tennessee has um, Tennessee has lost every series. Oh, here, there's that other stat. First time under Tony Vitello that Tennessee has dropped three straight series. Uh, Tennessee dropped the series two games to one at LSU. Dropped the series at Florida at, at home against Florida two games to two, two games to one, and were swept on the road at Arkansas this past weekend. So we'll see what's in store. Vanderbilt is a good ball club. Uh, it really, really is, and uh, they've got pretty much four starters who can pitch three games. They've been skipping guys in the starting rotation here lately. Um, you know, Carter Holton's a guy four four and oh three forty six ERA. Devin Fitrell, six and one two thirty five ERA. Those guys are really good. Bryce Cunningham's a guy, 1-1, one 386. The start of the year is a bullpen guy, but has been starting here of late. Uh, they also have they also have uh, Southpaw Hunter Owen, 3-0, and a 333 ERA, and eight games started. So uh, they're pretty good, and uh, we'll see exactly which rotation they, they throw out there for Tennessee, who will go with the same rotation as last week, and Andrew Lindsey, Chase Dolander, Andrew Beam. And uh, we'll see what happens. Offensively, they've been okay. Uh, this being Vanderbilt, uh, you got a guy. The, the guy you got to worry about at the top is transfer RJ Shriek, an outfielder, hitting over 350 with nine rib- nine home runs and 42 ribbies. Enrique Bridefield Jr. You guys that follow baseball know that name. 352, and he's stolen 26 of 30 would-be bases this year. Uh, that's another thing with Tennessee, but that's a conversation for another day about throwing out base runners and allowing those base runners that dictate what you do on the mound. So uh, we will see what happens right now. I will say this for Tennessee um, postseason play. It's, it's looking bleak, but uh, it's a brand that the, that the committee wants in and it's a team that they want in to get more eyeballs to watch its product. Uh, Right now, Tennessee has been projected in the D one baseball regional projections as a three seed in the Indiana region. And I believe they are also with baseball America, they're in the Louisville region, facing number one, uh, or opposite of Louisville, opposite or facing Louisville, excuse me, as a three seed, uh, along with number one Indiana and number four Central Michigan in uh, that realm. So, D1 baseball right now projects Tennessee as a three seed in the Bloomington region, with number two Louisville, along with number one Indiana and number four Kent State. Baseball America projects Tennessee as a three seed, opposite of Louisville or with Louisville, squaring off against Louisville, and opposite of number one, Indiana, and number four, Central Michigan. All that's very confusing. My point is, Tennessee is being projected in the regional field of play right now because they're banking on Tennessee getting to that lucky number 14. We will see if Tennessee can do that, okay? Um, it all starts at Vanderbilt this weekend. So, big, big series coming up. Uh, you know, Make the case that series is on the line coming up here for Tennessee this weekend, and all three of those games will be televised nationally on the SEC Network Friday night, and then ESPN2 at noon on Saturday and at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. So we'll see how Tennessee responds. It's uh, put up or shut up time, essentially, is what Tony Vitello said earlier this week. And uh, we'll recap a little bit of it right here on Lockdown Balls if you guys want to hear it. I, I cover ball, I cover baseball 
over to fallquest.com, and I'd be happy to talk baseball with any of you guys that want to hear it. All right, guys, as always, thank you so much for tuning in to Locked On Vols. It's your first listen each and every day, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Shout out to the everydayers. Appreciate you guys for another week of awesome Tennessee football conversations and recruiting and basketball and a little bit of baseball. What do you say we do it again next week? We'll be back at it live for you Monday morning on your commute to work. Enjoy the weekend. Stay safe. And uh, really appreciate you guys. This has been Locked On Vols.